uh, this will be an introduction to graph databases so for all the people who are thinking about them and uh, basically asking questions what are they for yep this talk is for you uh, for the more advanced uh, talks and topics stay in this room and from what we saw you will learn some things okay uh, some some things about me i'm the chief architect in uh, it imagination it's a big polish it company uh, uh, there i i'm help in running one of the biggest uh, .NET projects in Poland. After hours, uh, I basically dig into data, so basically, yeah, Neo4j is for this, and making sense of it, and also distributed systems. And I'm al also running a pet project called Cookit.pl. It's a contextual search engine for co cooking wing recipes, and we will look at it later. Okay, so graphs, what are graphs? This is a graph, it's a bit lonely graph, it's a single, single node, but still, it's a graph. So let's make it a more interesting. Let's add a friend. And if we are adding a friend, we are adding a relationship. As simple as this graph is, it's way useful because this is basically Facebook. I know you, you know me. Yeah, that's it. And if we like to spice things a bit, we can add a, a, a direction to this uh, relationship. And this actually is Twitter. If I am observing you, you are not necessarily observing me. So, a stalker relationship, don't do it. Uh, next, uh, this is the, we are adding the weight to the relationship. So, this is basically the most common thing that people are thinking when they're thinking graphs. So, basically cities. Cities, cities roads and roads also have a direction. Next, let's get a bit funky. So, uh, if we allow for two nodes to have multiple re rela relationships of the same type between them, we get a multi multi relation uh, graph. While while they are funky, they basically uh, don't have uh, uh, that much of a use, and they can in most cases be implemented by this, just basically counting the edges. Let's go next. Uh, uh, next we have a labeled graph. So basically, we are able to add labels to nodes and re relationships. It's kind of useful, there are some implementations, but the best graph and most practical is the property graph. So we are able to add labels and basically any meta metadata con connected to the nodes and the edges. And one question, does this remind anyone of something? And, and if I do this, I add one to many, many to one and so on. And if I do this, no, <sighs> there won't be any treats. Basically, when I was starting to read it, it's, this is how we draw re relational databases. So there's a guy standing in funny pants saying to you that basically we have graph databases, but we have relations, that uh, relations are in the <coughs> relational databases, and we have relations in graphs, so what's up? To understand why relational databases are completely not uh, similar to graph databases, let's go a bit into history because history is fun. Um, basically, relational uh, databases started in 1970 by Mr. Edgar Cott, who wrote a paper. Uh, it had some pages, and to, to best understand why did, did it gain so much, so much traction that basically relational databases are everywhere now, let's see what always happened in the 1970s. Well, RAM got actually quite cheap, because for $700 we could get one megabyte, and for those young people in here, Megabyte is the lesser of gigabyte. <laughs> yeah. And it got cheap because two years uh, earlier it was about two and a half thousand. Uh, next, IBM released its first uh, dishwasher with 100 megabytes of this space. Uh, when I'm saying dishwasher, it's basically because it looks like a dishwasher. It's here. So, and it has one, also one common thing with a dishwasher the access time and the read time. In the specs, they are, they are actually uh, down to the bytes, how fast you can transfer it, and it's like one megabyte, comma, zero, zero, something. So, yeah, it was slow. Uh, next, Intel releases its 8-bit uh, processor, so we can play Mario, uh, and we have almost 800 kilohertz. It's, again, gigahertz, megahertz, kilohertz. Uh, yeah, it was slow. And th uh, three years later, we have 16 bits and one megabyte of memory, so yeah. Things just got, got awesome. Uh, next, uh, Oracle, of course, implements the 
implements the re relational database paper and we have uh, we have a relational database and Apple re releases its its first and only not non-wide computer. Uh, next we have the absolute grand grandfather of almost every processor you have in your notebooks or PCs or anything, the Intel 8086, and we have a massive whopping up to 10 megahertz of processing power. So yeah, this is the relational, the relational database history. Let's now in contrast, look how the graph one looks. First, in uh, 1736, it's the graph problem by Mr. Euler. And it, this history has kings and queens and so on and so on, but basically it's, uh, it's all, we all agree that it's the beginning of really, uh, graphs in mathematics. Next, map coloring problem. And we'll get back to it uh, in some time because it correlates with computer history. Next, if we are talking about math and we want to be serious, we should have a book. So in 1936, we have a book. And then it's the official moment that graph theory in mathematics officially starts. Next, map coloring problem is partly solved. Well, why partly? Because basically the proof said, yeah, we are right, we can color, color every map uh, using uh, four, four colors, but basically there are about 20,000 maps that should be processed manually to actually prove that they can't be can, uh, they can't be color, uh, color with less than three colors. And because we didn't have enough crayons and we are lazy, we had to wait 30 years for, for actually solving it. And we actually solved it using a computer, of course. Next, uh, Intel releases its uh, Pentium 4 and it has a whopping almost three gigahertz of processing power. And another question, does anyone remember or is old enough like me uh, to know which part of the PC also evolved quite rapidly thanks to the uh, thanks to the Intel 4. The ra radiator. It was a time when we thought that yeah, water cooling was, would be in every PC. Pentium 4 had such massive heating problems that basically Intel said, well, let's put it in in a drawer. They took Pentium 3, put two chips in one processor, and this is how we got a uh, uh, Core call Duo. And next, in two, 2003, the first commercial graph, dat graph databases. So why I'm, why I'm showing here? Because if you look, this history is completely <laughs> different. When we got the, re the relational databases, we had a massive gains in computing power. And we, when we uh, had graph databases, we already knew that we can't go faster on one, one, co one core. And if you think, one more thing, if you think about relational databases and you think about the normal forms and if you think for a moment, why do we have normal forms? It, the answer is quite simple, to actually save the amount of storage of this space that we are using. If you are, if you are uh, replacing a string with an int, so creating, a, creating another uh, table, you are actually reducing the space it will actually take. And now, gigabytes are cheap. Why? Okay. So uh, we know what, now let's see how the landscape actually looks like. First, we have Flock. Flock is basically a database, relational database for the poor. Why? Because Flock uh, actually can get only the parents of the nodes. It can't traverse through the graph. You may think, why, why would someone implement it? And the answer is quite simple. Flock was implemented by Twitter. And Twitter has a use case that if you tweet something, it, it gets all all people following you and moves that tweet to, the, to, uh, to your uh, Twitter feed. And that's all. So it actually shows that m many graph databases are implemented in some specific um, problem in mind. If you will use them in a specific problem, they are awesome. They are, in most cases, not, not a general purpose, uh, purpose uh, databases as we made relational databases. As, uh, through 50 years. Next, Microsoft uh, Trinity project, it's then been called uh, Graph, Microsoft Graph, then it was, I think, killed. Yeah, but basically the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the idea behind it is like, Microsoft has Azure, so they thought, let's process massive graphs in Azure. So what they did is basically created a graph engine that only sends messages, mm -hmm. basically. So they abstracted, in a way, created a virtual actor for graphs, and so yeah. It was, it was created in, with Azure in mind. Next, Titan, now it's uh, been replaced with Julius. 
and it's a graph engine that basically you can swap uh, storage engines and it can combine a lot of things. Net next, OrinDB. Uh, if you don't know what to use, OrinDB basically has relational uh, capabilities, graph key capabilities, key value store capabilities, and everything you can imagine. Uh, yeah, people are using it. Next, affinity index. Uh, one is for IoT and low latency. The other is for mobile devices. If you have a case that you actually want to use, uh, want to calculate graphs on a mobile devices, why not? Next, Neo4j, and it's without no reason that it's in the uh, top right corner. We'll be seeing a lot of Neo uh, even in the stock later, so I will, I won't con concentrate on it. Next, Allegro graph and HyperGroup DB. Those databases are being uh, developed in, in one use case in mind, basically graph storage, uh, sorry, knowledge storage and basically going uh, through uh, knowledge. Okay, let's go further. Usage. This is the Amazon page and you can't see it, but yeah, basically wh when you go to Amazon, you, you can see that Amazon basically doesn't show you similar books. They show you books that people frequently bought together and so on and so on. So how does Amazon do it? This is my guess. So quite simple. Let's take one person. He goes into Amazon, browses a bit and buys something. Let's take another person and another. So basically what you see is when you think in a graph way, those are pages and so also product, products, you actually can see the patterns in data. Some, some nodes and some edges that just, just are thicker and light up as, as a Christmas tree. So what do we see from here? Basically, if anyone enters this node, we should be showing this node because people, people aren't buying as often this node, but from this node going to this node. So they, they, they in some way may be similar that we can't know uh, precisely. But yeah, this is our buying path. Let's go in a similar use case of also connected with money, money laundering. If you have a million euros, you can't actually buy a house, buy a Porsche and so on, because the IRS will come and ask you some simple question, where did you get the money? And then you will be sad. Yeah, so basically what you do is basically is give this money to a lot of people. Uh, and, bas uh, and basically they go through, uh, through the ch chain of uh, restaurants and so on. And this is exactly the same uh, as was done in the Panama Papers. How they did it? They just inputted each invoice at a time, basically who paid who and how much. And after some time they, they started seeing some, some uh, relationship, relationship ships and thanks to this they were able to see a really stupid face of a prime minister of Iceland when he was asked what are his connections with some foreign offshore company? Yeah. Uh, well, my computer is uh, attacking me, so sorry. Uh, yeah. uh, some technical problems, sorry. Okay, let's go further. NLP, and this is an oversimplification, I know, but uh, stay with me. If we have a, a sentence saying, Sushi, find me all sushi restaurants in New York that my friends like. We can easily understand each word, word of the sentence, sushi restaurants that my friends like, uh, but answering to this question is quite complicated. Well, it is not. Because if you graph this, basically, get me, my friends, basically, I don't have that many, but yeah, let's say, uh, uh, get, get a no, node of loca location, like location New York, get the Type, type, of the, type of the cuisine. So as you see, we have this part, we have this part. So the answer to this question will actually be the nodes filling, uh, filling the graph. It's basically that, that easy. And there's also one interesting thing, because if you were are talking about, for, for example, Facebook, we are talking about billions, billions, and hundreds of billions, of billions of nodes. But actually, no. In each query, in each part of this query, we actually uh, triggered each node and its children, it, so it's fast. Yeah, next, next uh, knowledge graphs. So basically, uh, New York Times had this case that they have a huge, no huge knowledge graph because if you write any article, you want to have contextual, actual, uh, actual news, actual, actual data. So if, if you take Apple, Apple 
can be a fruit, can be apple ink, can be uh, some some films. There are even a Star Trek episode. Yeah, there's also uh, Apple Records. Uh, that's the Beatles. A Russian party is nicknamed Apple. So there are a lot of it. And if you look uh, at those types of data in a relational model, so basically you have the apple. It's one apple. Then you label each type, and according to the, each label, you look at the different relationships, you can do really awesome stuff like knowledge graphs uh, from Google. You see Euler and Euler has some fields like born, diet, education and influenced. And basically influence is a field you wouldn't normally put on a person but someone, someone may argue that yeah it's for famous people and so on so you have the field influence. But then again you have Spock and Spock has a, has a field species and with a value of Vulcan and this value is a link. So with graph databases, you are, when you are adding knowledge, you are not changing, the, changing you, are, you are adding knowledge, and this, this knowledge influences your database. You don't have to think in, um, ahead of your structure, your tables, relationships, because if you do it, you won't have Spock. Uh, next, performance. In short, short theory, basically what are you doing if you are implementing a relational database in a uh, hierarchical structure in a relational database? You have a, let's say, table, uh, table persons, which is quite long, has many columns, and you have table person child. And the problem with pers person child is that it's quite narrow because it has ID, parent ID, child, uh, child ID. And what you are doing when you are asking a, a relational graph question is basically you are taking one ID and matching with this huge, ta huge table with parent-child. Then you have an, some, some IDs, like 5, 10, and then again, once again, you are matching it with this huge table. It, you get the point. It's, it's not the best way to do it. In graph, in graph databases, you actually store the IDs at the node. So getting the note, you actually have the IDs, so you don't have to process it individually and do this join all, all the time. But enough talk, let's see examples. Let's take Twitter from 2009. Basically, you will have the slide, but this, this is the whole description. Almost two, almost two billion watches, uh, more than 40 million users, and with the statistics. What they've done is using Titan, is basically bought 40, the cheapest virtual machines on Amazon, and six really expensive ones. And what they were able to achieve is those machines were processing all the time in a loop, basically. So this is the times that, that, that they got. And it's quite, quite fast, and it's what, what is even more interesting, it cost them 11 bucks an hour. And that's cheap. And um, yeah, let's go. Neo4j. Uh, why Neo4j? Why, Neo4, why did, did I get interested in Neo4j? Because uh, there's a site, dbengines.com, and on this site, uh, Neo4j is the 20th or 21st uh, the, uh, the most popular d database, and it's a really good position. Uh, and of course, it's what is the number one graph database there is. It has drivers for almost any, any language. Uh, Cypher just got, is, we have, op, we have uh, open Cypher, so Cypher is basically the, in the industry standard for asking graph questions. That's it. And of course there is a free version. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, so my problem, we have, I have Cookit. Cookit is a con contextual search engine. So what it does is basically scrape, scra uh, scrapes the web. It's looking for a page that has a, a co cooking <coughs> recipe. Then it extracts the text. Then from the text, it extracts the ingredients, amounts, units, and a lot of data. It's, it's, it's doing it in automatically. So uh, one part of one of, most, of the most critical parts is basically in, in, connecting those ingredients found in the text with the actual ingredients. And this is actually the graph of my ingredients. And ingredients have are about 3,000 uh, nodes. They have more, more than 3,000 edges. And because this is uh, a tree, so there are no cycles, the, deep, the depth of this graph is about uh, ninth level. And there are eight, eight main ingredient groups. So basically, what so but what was my problem is that I have errors and sometimes I misinterpret some ingredients. So I basically wanted to do uh, some sanity check uh, on my data. So I wanted to ask this. If there are any in 
recipes that have fish and sweet drinks, like Coca-Cola. You don't normally see those two things in one recipe if any sane not, not student p person is cooking it. <laughs> I used to do really crazy stuff uh, cooking at studying. So basically, let's do it in Neo. First, I have a match, and match is the keyword, uh, and this will be Cypher, and Cypher is, it's a crazy love between SQL and ASCII art, so, yeah, but it's really good. It's better than SQL. Uh, you have a match, and match say, says that, yeah, I will be showing patterns, and this is a very important word, I will be showing patterns, now, not exact, they, not exact matches I will be looking. Yeah, so next, I'm saying that I want to, I want to find a note, if I put anything in a round braces, this is a note. So yeah, you actually can get the ASCII out. Uh, and the, this note has to be type of recipe, and I'm calling it the R. Next, I'm ha I, I also want ing ingredients, the same notation. Next, I want a, re a relationship between those, and this is the name of the, re of the relation. And yeah, this means uh, th this actually shows you the ASCII art part. Next, I, w I would like to uh, ret uh, return them. So, yeah, R and N. Next, a bit more funky part and the most awesome part uh, is like I get the I get the ingredient, and I saying that well traverse from this node uh, through uh, through uh, through uh, relationships of type from and specification and do it from one to to, uh, to ninth level basically. So I'm doing yeah, and until you get to uh, to the node of type ingredient which has a, ma a data of name sweet drinks, and I'm doing exactly the same with fish. And as it turn out, turns out, you really should put a limit on it. Yeah. Uh, this query actually uh, takes on SQL Server about 20 seconds. On the Neo, I was able without any problems to get to 100 milliseconds. Yeah, because I am asking a relational graph query and it's freakingly fast. And what's fast? I could do it faster probably on, uh, on a relational database, but I would have to denormalize my data. And in this case, this is a sanity check. It's not a part of my domain, so I don't want to have any. Uh, I don't want to change my domain, change my database f to fit to an answer this query faster. Yeah. So uh, to wrap up, because my time is actually ending, I think. Uh, when to use graph data databases? When you are talking about hierarchical data structures, basically. Uh, next, where there's a saying that you should use. Um, you should use uh, graph databases when your relationships are w more interesting than your data. So what this, this sentence is saying is that basically uh, if you are more, more interested in the relations than your data, like actually the uh, text and the blob storage and so on, go, go to graph databases. Next, uh, for searching patterns in data, you can actually visualize quite easily they are, and they are really good tools, uh, also integrating with Neo4j very, very easy used in Panama Papers, for example, and to get the sense of the data. Where, and when you should not use graph databases. First, for data manipulation and heavy systems. And if, you no, if your nodes will have hundreds of fields or will have huge uh, blob objects and so on and so on, think about it twice because graph databases are for relationship, not exactly for storing blob files with have 100 megabytes in each node. Next. When you are thinking about big data, ACID transactionality is, won't probably be your best pick because it will be heavy. And the last but the most important, I really wouldn't like uh, for someone saying, yeah, yeah, I will just scrap my relational database and replace it with a graph database because in some cases it will be really awesome and fast, but they are not the most general purpose uh, databases that Basically, racial databases aren't also, but during the, those 50 years, we we uh, we were able to make relation databases good at almost anything, but not super good and uh, and but not uh, super good at anything. Yeah. So, questions, and I will wrap up. Thanks. Thank you.